In the next segment, we'll explore Leon Russell's mentorship of Reginald Dwight and what the outcome looked like for each of them. In the last section, we learned how the Beatles mentored an up-and-coming act called Badfinger. In this section, let's rewind back to 1968 again and talk about how Leon Russell mentored an up-and-coming artist at this time. There's an up-and-coming artist on the other side of London from Badfinger who's on the verge of getting a record deal with Dick James Music, an old-school artifact of the 1940s and 50s big band days that was struggling to adapt to the age of rock and roll. The artist's name was Reginald Dwight, Reg for short, a gifted, classically trained pianist who was heavily influenced by American R&B, gospel, and blues. The lyrics of his early songs suggest a fixation on Roy Rogers and other American Western TV shows. Dick James paid Reg to write music for the artists on its label. Old school acts like Engelbert Humperdinck, Tom Jones, and Long John Baldry. All the while, Reg was busy writing and recording his own songs on the side. During the late 60s, English musicians were heavily influenced by American blues of the Deep South. Artists like Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, Lead Belly, and Muddy Waters. Bands including the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin were successfully repackaging the sounds of the American Deep South with an English twist and shipping it back to America. Reg's biggest influence, though, was Leon Russell, who was like a human embodiment of all those genres. Leon began as a session artist just like Reg, worked on his own music on the side, and had recently emerged as a wildly successful solo act. This was during that master of space and time period when Leon was everywhere and seemingly all at once. Reg loved the natural amalgamation of rock, soul, gospel, R&B, and even country that so naturally flowed from Leon's fingertips and vocal cords. Meanwhile, Reg was performing with a backup band for Long John Baldry called Bluesology. And this convinced him of what he didn't want to do. The music was just too blasé and had no soul. By 1969, Reg had enough original songs recorded to present Dick James' music with the opportunity to back him as a solo artist. They bet. But his first release, called Empty Sky, didn't do well wasn't perceived to be cutting edge like David Bowie or Mark Boland, who were big at the time. Dick James saw promise, though, and invested heavily in a second release that was beautifully orchestrated and led with a title song called Your Song, which was kind of a tribute to Reg's hero, Leon Russell, who had a song for you as the first song on his first release. Alas, this release didn't perform well in England either, but before chucking it away as a failed project, Dick James shared the music with Russ Regan, the president of Uni Records in Los Angeles, who loved it and saw promise for Reg in the American market. In what was a Hail Mary for sure, Dick James flew Reg to LA for one week where he gave three make it or break it performances at the famed Troubadour Club. It was August of 1970. Reg was 23 years old and up to bat for the break of his lifetime. Now with every breakout artist, there's that moment where Lady Luck strikes. And the question is whether the artist can capitalize on it or not. And this was that night for Reg. He was at the right place, at the right time, and he had the just right product. And it just happened that a respected music critic from the LA Times, Robert Hilburn, happened to be at the Troubadour that Tuesday evening and loved the performance. Now this was way pre-internet, but the buzz went around town. And by the second night's performance, Music greats like Three Dog Night, Stephen Stills, and even Diana Ross were in the room to hear this new artist for themselves. Oh, and one other artist was in the room, none other than Leon Russell. And it's probably best to hear Reg's reaction directly. But before I play the clip, I should point out that Reg had by now developed a new stage name by combining the names of two of the musicians from his old bluesology band. The thing, and I go, see, you're always relating to things. This is Jerry Lee Lewis, that's what he's doing. I was having a ball, and we rocked. Had a great three-piece band. And I came out and did 60 Years On, but it wasn't really like the record. It was more like an extended jam version. He had terrific songs of a, of a wide range. He was not copying what other people were doing. So by the end of the evening, it was just like the place was a buzz. You know, it was like, can you believe what you just saw? And I couldn't wait to run to the typewriter and sit down and write. 
That one night and that one review saved me a year's work. I mean, there was no internet to spread it, but it, it flew, word of mouth. Overnight, Elton had gone from the last chance saloon to the talk of the town. It was so exciting for us. We could see in the audience these people with Steve Stills with her, some of the three dog night guys with her. I think even Diana Ross was there. Hey, Leon! <laughs> Also in the crowd was the songwriter and piano man of the times that Elton admired the most. The second night at the Troubadour, I was halfway through Burn Down the Mission, and then I saw Leon in the second row, um, in the long grey hair and the aviator glasses, and I practically froze, because he was, at that particular time in my life, he was my idol, without question. <laughs> Leon Russell was a cult figure on the American music scene, a sought-after session man and songwriter. I was petrified meeting him afterwards because I thought he was going to tie me to a chair and say, listen, this is how to play. And then, of course, he um, embraced me and was very complimentary. He was quite a beautiful soul singer, had a huge blues awareness that I found interesting. I, I thought my career was over because uh, he was a lot more active and a lot, lot more showmanship. <laughs> I figured I'd had it. Was Leon Russell threatened by this up-and-coming protege? Maybe, but he embraced Elton and provided helpful tips ranging from ones as mundane as how to deal with a sore throat as to as complex as how to navigate the American music scene. Imagine Elton's euphoria in having the performer he idolized the most embrace him and help his career actually lift off. One of the most helpful things Leon did that year was inviting Elton to be the opening act for several dates on his sold out tour. The best thing about the relationship was that Leon didn't dole out advice. He didn't offer up a hit song and dictate exactly how it was to be performed. He didn't sign Elton to his record label, though he wanted to. He did serve as a role model inspiring much of Elton's early work. Think Burn Down the Mission House, totally inspired by Leon Russell. He shared experience. Now advice is cheap and often contradictory. Experience is priceless. While things were peaking for Leon Russell in the early 70s, followed by a 30 year steady decline into oblivion, things fell into place for Elton like an endless string of upright dominoes. He had an amazing lyricist in Bernie Toppin for whose words he provided the perfect accompaniment. With John Reed, Elton got a twofer, as John Reed became both his lover and his manager. In summary, Elton quickly developed the full package in terms of team, product, and market. And he capitalized brilliantly over the next five years, becoming the number one pop star of his generation. He tapped into and commanded the glam rock scene of the mid 70s. Think of all those sequin suits and Donald Duck outfits, crazy stuff like David Bowie and Mark Dolan were defining it, Elton John totally channeled it, something Badfinger hadn't managed to accomplish. When Elton's career finally did begin to recede, he reinvented himself and rocketed back to the top to a whole new generation of listeners by composing and performing the score to Disney's classic movie, The Lion King. By 1975, Elton John was a multimillionaire and Pete Ham was dead. So besides the band name, what did Elton get so right and Pete get so wrong? Certainly, there's a comparison to be made between early stage artists and early stage entrepreneurs. This is where my 30 years as both an entrepreneur and a facilitator of promising new entrepreneurs comes into play. In all my highs and lows over the years, as well as the highs and lows I've witnessed from the entrepreneurs I've worked with, certain patterns emerge. So here are my top four learnings from watching, seeing the mentorship of the Beatles with Badfinger compared with the mentorship of Leon Russell with Elton John. First, one must pay the dues. There's no shortcut. Each of the 70s rock stars I've profiled spent thousands of grueling hours honing their craft prior to their respective overnight successes. It's the same way with teams of entrepreneurs. You hear of exceptions that rocketed from nowhere to fame and fortune, but the rule is, Thousands of hours were spent with nobody watching, building domain expertise before that breakout success occurred. 
only when the entrepreneur has built a deep understanding of both the product and the market that's going to be served by the product can product market fit be achieved. Second, one must build a team with complementary skills and domain expertise. Lennon and McCartney, one of the most successful songwriting teams of all time, had very different approaches to writing music, but it worked much better together than when they wrote separately. Elton John was a genius at writing melodies, but he was terrible at poetry. Bernie Taupin, his partner, was a master poet, but he couldn't write a melody to save his life. Neither of these songwriting teams would have made it far without a strong and reasonably honest manager to manage the business side. For the Beatles, they got lucky they found Brian Epstein, or rather, he found them. For Elton John, it was John Reed. For Leon Russell, he had several managers ranging from decent to not so good. And for Badfinger, it was just terrible. Every startup team has significant gaps. Therefore, it's important to define those gaps and fill them with mentors and advisors until they can be properly filled with full-time team members. Third, great mentors share valuable experience, not advice. Great entrepreneurs seek out great mentors, knowing that leveraging that experience can save a lot of time and avoid a lot of pitfalls. The Beatles, specifically Paul and George, went to lengths to support the artists that signed to the Apple record label, especially Badfinger. But much of that support was directed toward the artist's relative strength areas, songwriting, performance, and recording. The Beatles were sadly much less helpful in the areas of weakness, most notably in finding and hiring good management, which wasn't their strength either. Also, with the Beatles, there was a lot more do it this way, do it my way, as exemplified in Paul giving that hit song to Badfinger, but only if they played it note for note exactly as he specified. Conversely, when Leon met Elton, he shared helpful experience, like how he handled sore throats while on the road. Elton knew his greatest need that, that Leon could help him with was more exposure in America. After all, it was his first trip to America in his life. And Leon gave him that experience by carving out an opening act slot for several of his sold-out shows on his tour. Lastly, and this is most important, Leon gave first, gave first, without regard for any financial incentives. Now he knew that a financial incentive might come later or it might not. He gave of himself anyway and Elton remembered this. Last point, number four, remember the people that helped you along the way and think about paying it forward by helping the next generation of up and coming talent. Let's see how that worked out for Leon with his mentorship of Elton. I grew up listening to so many different piano players starting with Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, Floyd Kramer, um, going through the whole roster till suddenly in the late 60s, I heard a record by Delaney and Bonnie. And I thought, wow, I, this guy who plays on this record, um, he's got everything I like. He's got soul and gospel and kind of bluegrass and everything going. And, uh, and then I, didn't, I went to see Delaney and Bonnie in England and I saw him and he looked like something from uh, outer space. He was... Uh, <laughs> pretty amazing but then he did the Joe Cocker Mad Dogs and Englishmen and uh, then he really looked like something from outer space uh, he became the master of space and time and he wore that hat and those aviator glasses and he looked like a mean mother <laughs> I met him after the show and not only was he sweet and kind he uh, gave me a recipe for my voice which I still use to this day and he asked me to do some dates with him. And listen, he was my idol. To meet him, I was shaking. For me, he sang, he wrote, and he played just how I wanted to do it. Only recently have I discovered how many people's records he played on. Leon played on Bing Crosby, Johnny Mathis, Doris Day, Dean Martin, Herb Alpert, Frank Sinatra, Strangers in the Night. Da 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 da. Remember that? The Ventures, The Everly Brothers, Del Shannon, Dwayne Eddy, Bobby V, Bobby Darren, Jan and Dean, Let There Be Drums, Sandy Nelson, that was Leon. The Fleetwoods, Come Softly to Me, that was Leon. Connie Francis, The Crystals, The Ronettes, every Phil Spector record. The Birds, Mr. Tambourine Man, Delaney and Bonnie, The Beach Boys, every Beach Boys record, including Pet Sounds. J.J. Cale, Harry Nilsson, Bob Dylan, Joe Cocker, Freddie King and B.B. King, just to name some of them that he played on.
I lost touch with Leon in the early 1970s. And in 2009, I was in Africa and I was shaving and I put some music on the iPod and I pressed Leon Russell and I started to sob. And that music took me back to one of the greatest times of my life. And I thought, I have to call this person up. He gave me such a wonderful start in my life. He meant, he meant so much to me and I haven't talked to him for so long. Um, so I called him and I said, would you like to do an album? And he said, sure. Last year in January, Leon and I embarked upon what was one of the greatest years of my life, uh, both musically and personally, because I got to know the man that I never knew. I got to spend time with him in the studio. Um, he was frail when he came in the studio. He had a five and a half hour brain operation. And suddenly, with the love from the musicians in the studio and the, all the other peers that came to pay tribute to him, he became stronger. And uh, I said to him, there's one thing I want for you. I want people to acknowledge you for what you've done, to remember you for what you've written, what you've played on, and for you to be proud again of what you've done. And I want you to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And here we are a year later, and he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And You know, at the end of the year, I phoned him up and said, Leon, it's been a great year. He said, yeah, I got a new bus. And I've got to know and love someone who I treasured as a musician, treasured as an artist. So I, it's my great pleasure to show you a film about Leon Russell. I feel like I have to say, if you leave this place tonight and you don't feel like you had a religious experience, why don't you just get your money back? Because I don't need it. You hear me? Two, three, four. Roll away. Oklahoma, at the time I was living there, was a dry state. Consequently, there wasn't any liquor laws, and I was able to start playing in nightclubs when I was 14. Don't leave me laying out here. What will they do in 2000 years? Bangladesh concert was really an opportunity for me to go out and play out all my rock and roll fantasies that I'd had ever since I was five or six. A couple of numbers from Leon. Can I have the theory that really most writers just have one song? If you can get that one right, well, you're doing okay. I love you in a place where there's no space and time. I love you for my life, you are a friend of mine. And when my life is over, remember when we were together. Oh. We were alone and I was singing this song to you An American legend, an American icon, Leon Russell. inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I have to tell you something else that's also great. About a year ago, Elton came and found me in a ditch by the side of the highway of life. He took me up to the high stages with big audiences and uh, treated me like a king. And the only thing I can say is, bless your heart. Also, uh, I want to say thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, hallelujah.
wow, wouldn't you love to be a mentor and be remembered that way later on? I'm not saying being a mentor is going to have you put into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, two years before you pass away, but it just might. Let's think about what we can give back, folks. Great mentorship can be the difference maker for an entrepreneur to bring to the world that next great idea.